Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate the support, especially during our last week of classes. I can't believe we're here. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Emily Fox. And for my Center for Digital Strategies project, I decided to focus on old school physical retail. So the opposite of digital, go figure. Uh, but my goal was to understand how and why brands that have been sworn off from brick and mortar have actually gone back on their word and have opened stores. Uh, so, like I said, the focus of my project is digitally native, direct to consumer brands. Digitally native means that they were established exclusively with an e-commerce presence. Um, so in addition to launching online, the e-commerce strategy has really been core to the identity of these brands. Um, so much so that many of them never envisioned they would move to an offline channel. In 2012, Everlane CEO said, we are going to shut the company down before we go to physical retail. Then in 2017, Everlane opened their first physical store in New York and they've opened five cents. Uh, this resurgence of brick and mortar um, has come out of the 2009 financial crisis with tens of thousands of stores closing then uh, and analysts claiming that physical retail was over for good. Uh, but many companies, especially DDC brands, have found that stores are quite successful and have complemented their online presence really nicely. But here we are in 2020. It's funny, I made this slide back in the winter, uh, and I'm amazed by the foresight I had posing the question, will the resurgence survive? Um, the pandemic that we're in the midst of has been a huge detriment to stores and brands that have real estate on their books are really struggling right now. So it's unclear what will happen. I won't answer that in this presentation, but I'm excited to share some observations I've had about the how and why of opening physical stores. Um, and before diving into findings, I do want to be clear on the scope of my project. Uh, I'm looking at brands that started exclusively online and sell direct to consumers and have since opened up their own branded stores. Um, actually, few of these brands maintain this pure online only strategy. Uh, I read something recently, um, even Shopify has been planning and strategizing for ways that they're going to support physical retail, um, which again is against uh, their identity, but everybody is thinking about the way to complement uh, offline, uh, online with offline. My project takes the form of a third graders book report um, so in a slightly different order, I'm really going to address the who, what, where, when, why of brick and mortar. Uh, I'll present my observations on these topics. I collected a lot of data um, about these brands from their own press releases, um, from their sources of funding. Um, and, and after reviewing those, uh, those findings, I'll wrap up and discuss what this means for entrepreneurs and brand managers who might be thinking about moving into physical retail. So first, let's address when brands open up their first stores. I had a hypothesis that the timing of store openings was related to the timing of venture capital funding. The chart here plots uh, brands with the x-axis representing date of the first store opening and the y-axis representing the series of funding that they closed right before that first store opening. Um, and I've observed that most brands open stores right after that new capital is committed and that funding round closes. The size of the bubble represents total funding at the time of that store opening. 
this paints a picture of historic norms of branded store introduction and the more recent proliferation. Historically, you see digitally native brands establishing a physical presence shortly after completing Series B. So that seemed to be an appropriate time um, given the growth trajectory of these companies. But more recently, brands have been pursuing this strategy earlier and later um, with some in Series A, some in C, and even one observation in Series D. So that begs the question, who's behind this on the capital front? I collected data on all of the investors backing each of these brands and identified the investors most frequently funding these digitally native brands. Uh, without being in the room with investors and entrepreneurs and without being privy to their conversations, it's hard to claim uh, that there's any linkage stronger than just correlation here. But you could imagine that these notable VC firms have some playbook for brick and mortar, um, especially after Warby Parker and Bonobos paved the way. I uh, would be willing to theorize that these firms are encouraging new brands that they take on um, to establish their own branded stores. So once brands are compelled to move into physical retail, they do not just dive right in and sign a lease. 100% of these brands um, that eventually open permanent stores experiment first. Of the brands that I could collect this um, experimentation data on, 64% tested with temporary pop-up shops and 36% experimented with a partnership. So this is a partnership with another retailer that gives them temporary space within a larger store. Um, it's often referred to as a store within a store. Moving on to where brands are launching their first stores in cities with the greatest density of existing customers. I had the chance to speak with a director at one of these brands and he emphasized that co the concentration of customers who've already adopted the product along with the customers who share similar demographics are the best metrics to optimize for. Um, because of this, not surprising, most companies end up setting up shops in New York City first. And the importance of location goes beyond the city itself. Um, on a more granular level, these brands are intentionally concentrated within specific neighborhoods, um, even concentrated down to the street level. You can find these brands right next to each other, um, and this is not an accident. Um, because they share similar target demographics, um, mostly targeting millennials, uh, these brands try to ride the coattails of one another um, because they're attracting the same traffic. Um, someone I spoke to mentioned that Apple is another great driver of traffic. Um, so they're really trying to establish themselves in commerce hubs. Um, in New York, the specific neighborhood is Soho. In LA, both Abbott Kinney Boulevard in Venice and Melrose in West Hollywood are uh, the DDC hotspots. SF is a little more dispersed, but brands are concentrated in Hayes Valley. Um, and finally in Boston, you see these brands in Fort Point and Seaport. So there are two main objectives driving these brands to open stores. The younger brands, as noted by their progression in um, their uh, series of fundraising, are looking to gain awareness. And the more established brands are trying to convert customers who are likely already aware of the brand and just convert them to purchase. Uh, I'll acknowledge the sample size is low, but for those that I could collect data on, we observe that companies who transition into physical retail after earlier funding rounds, so Series A or Series B, um, have a tendency to be seeking awareness. And companies later in their life cycle, those 
who have completed series D or C are more likely to be looking for conversion. In addition to timing, industry is another commonality that can speak to the purpose behind store openings. I noticed a pattern here with the types of companies that were um, stating their goal of moving into physical retail um, with one large category being awareness and conversion. Um, so the characteristics of companies looking to gain awareness include um, selling higher priced products, uh, lower purchase frequency products, um, and their stores are really attempting to showcase products in the wild. Uh, so they keep low inventory, they set up um, what might be like what might look like a room in an apartment to really just display what they're offering. Uh, and on the other hand, brands that are uh, looking to drive conversion are more likely to sell lower priced products. These are more frequently purchased products. Uh, and they're trying to give customers the opportunity to test these products and um, get a sense of the fit and feel, recognizing that they were probably already exposed to the brand online, but they weren't at a point where they were ready to click buy yet. The industry characteristics that make brands more likely to seek awareness or conversion um, also includes customers' habits um, and um, their likelihood of shopping online for these things. So for products like apparel that customers are just used to buying online um, and seek out these things online, stores are there to get late adopters over that final hump. And for products that are like furniture, um, which customers are rarely looking for online um, or have been until recently, um, stores are more important for just building that awareness. So to summarize what I was able to find through this research, um, historically, these digitally native DC, DC brands have open stores after Series B, but more recently we have brands that are earlier or later in their life cycle um, doing it earlier or later. Um, there are a few notable VC firms that have backed numerous uh, DDC brands that move into physical retail. And my hypothesis is that they're the ones pushing and promoting this transition all of these brands experiment before opening up permanent stores. Um, the most common version of experimentation is pop-up shops. Location is critical. Um, so not only is the city that you choose to open your for first store in important, but um, the street address uh, is really key and just emphasizes that real estate isn't something these brands should be skimping on. Um, and then the purpose of why these brands decide to move into stores is twofold. Um, there's an objection, an, an objective for awareness and the objective of conversion. Um, and there are dividing lines both with the brand's life cycle and their industry that um, might put them in one bucket or the other, but I do recognize um, that there's a benefit of both that stores get. What does this mean for entrepreneurs and brand managers? Um, so I would say, think about the right timing. Timing can be different for everyone. Um, and I think your objectives, whether it's awareness, conversion, um, or something else, maybe you'd like to cross sell products. That's an important thing to think through before um, deciding that physical retail is the, night, the right next step. Um, I'd also advise managers to think about investors' expectations, especially before um, accepting capital. 
uh, because investors are known to push this strategy, uh, I think it's important to just make sure that founders, entrepreneurs, and investors are all on the same page. Um, definitely experiment, whether it's the pop-up shop model or partnerships. Uh, that has worked well for all of these brands. Um, some brands, not included in my analysis because they didn't open permanent stores, experimented, decided it was not the right next step, um, but that was what they needed to know before taking on a large expense. Um, and then finally, uh, don't overlook the value um, of a specific address. We see that um, setting up shop right next to other brands that attract the same type of customers um, has been a big benefit for the brands um, that are successful with their stores today. That's everything I have to present. I would love to hear what thoughts and comments you all have. Great, thank you, Emily, that was great. Um, so we've got a couple of hands. We'll start with Nadine. Hey, Emily, thanks for that. That was really great. Um, you mentioned one of the reasons why brands might open retail is to sort of drive awareness. Um, I was wondering if you think that reducing costs is actually another um, goal. So I'm thinking of Warby Parker and how they will send you glasses to try on. It's less expensive for you to just walk into a store and try them on. Or for example, here in Hanover, they'll pay for an adjustment for some other optician to do it. It's a lot cheaper to have you go in and do, for them to do it with staff that are already paying for. So do you think that's something that like other companies are thinking about as well? Or is that just like a Warby Parker thing? I think that's a benefit that they realize. So reducing costs, especially from shipping, going back and forth um, is probably something that they all experience. Uh, in my research, I was attempting to really look at the purpose before they opened a store. So I was digging through these company press releases. Um, and so uh, I'd imagine Warby Parker, maybe, maybe they did think of that, but with the exception of Rent the Runway, um, that definitely was looking to reduce shipping costs. I didn't see any other brands that proactively thought about that before opening stores. Um, but it is a really great point that there are extra benefits. But I, I was really trying to hone in on what was that primary driver um, that was pushing them to open a store. Chris? Emily, from a personal perspective, are there any DTC businesses where you have said to yourself, like, that will never work when they open a physical store? Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, I, I think it can work to some extent for everyone. I'm much more skeptical of the companies that are doing it just to gain awareness because it feels like there's an end of that road. Um, so with conversion, I, I think there are a lot of companies um, like Glossier, for example, that we're noticing they just hit this point in their growth trajectory they couldn't get over because some people just weren't willing to pay money to try it out and their stores were for creating trialability to get people for the long run. But um, and they've now since been cross-selling products and introducing them into their stores and they, they have to spend less on marketing to introduce customers to these like expanded product lines. But for something like Casper, which I know has its own problems, like if you're trying to create awareness, especially for the like things like mattresses that don't have this high purchase frequency, once you're exposed to it, you reach this critical point at which you can't do much more. So unless you're continuing to get people in the store um, and selling them on other complementary items, I, I think it's tough for the, the companies that have those like low, like low frequency products like, like a mattress. Gotcha. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure if there's anybody I think of and say like that's that's just gonna be a total flop. Thanks, Patrick. 
Yeah. Um, so a lot of DTC brands don't actually own product, their own products. They either source them or they license them or they, you know, have third party, you know, contractors making them. I'm thinking of like, if you think back to the, a lot of the razor blade kind of companies actually just go to, to the actual manufacturing sites for other people's razor blades and contract for a number of those. Like given that a lot of the expertise and the core competencies is more on branding and marketing, like opening a store is really tough. Like, are, did you find any, any indication that some of these, these companies really struggle with that? Or do you think maybe that's why the VCs that, that have experience in this are so important in driving this or enabling it or, like, how do you see that kind of shaking out and um, from, that, from that perspective? What I think is different about their stores is that they approach it totally differently than another company that would see opening a store as an operations problem. So they do think about it more as a marketing endeavor. Um, and even in the testing, they're focused on like, how can we cure, curate this connection between the brand and us? So like DDC companies recognize their strength is brand and by opening their own stores, I think they're holding on to that core competency of like, we are good at marketing and like we can do that well so long as it is our store that we own. Um, so I actually see it as a continuation of what they do well for companies that decide to um, introduce their product into another retailer, I think it's gone much less well. And I, I didn't focus on those companies just because I, I saw that it would expand the scope a, a little bit too much. But um, yeah, the companies that still keep it as vertically integrated as they can, I, I think are, are sticking to what they know best. There also have been a number of companies that are pretty large. I mean, obviously Amazon comes to mind as someone who sold online only and is now building physical retail out for a variety of reasons and then acquired Whole Foods. Um, I know backcountry.com just opened a couple stores in the last year in New York and others. Like, are there kind of transferable learnings from these folks to those folks, given that that's a very different kind of company product set, et cetera, et cetera? Or do you see some similarities in the way that you know, those companies might be able to learn from some of the DTC to physical retail transitions. I think the big thing that these companies do well is focusing on how customers like experience the products instead of just seeing stores as an inventory warehouse where people can also make a purchase. Um, so thinking first and foremost about what it's going to be like for a customer to enter that space and then envision the product that's on the shelf in their own environment, I think is what other retailers can do a lot better and they can take from these B2C brands. So they think of it less as another channel and more as an extension of their marketing endeavors. And there's a lesson there for folks to not get complicated with the channel strategy. Exactly. Right. Oh, Kathy, you were yeah, Kathy, saying? go ahead. So the two ways that you've mentioned companies can t try testing out a physical location or partnership and pop-ups. Do you have any insights into like why a company would choose one over the other? I think it mostly has to do with their like willingness and commitment to the, the physical retail. Um, so a partnership is much less capital intensive. You basically like get a table in a department store and set up your stuff. And often you don't even have to put money on the line. There's going to be a profit share agreement with that retailer. Um, so that's just a lower stakes way to go about it. And I think if you see a clear uh, complement between another retailer and their customers and who your brand is trying to attract, that can work really well. Um, to the point that I made about controlling your channels, it does take away a bit of the identity just because you are a store within a store. Um, but for those who 
have the runway with capital and are like a little bit more ready to commit to it, opening up a pop-up shop is easier. It's hard to get those um, temporary leases. So that can be one hurdle that might push someone to a partnership. But if, if you're pretty gung-ho about it and um, you have a clear vision for how you want the experience to look, a pop-up is the way to go. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. And then Emily, you did mention too, you know, obviously a lot of this may change and has changed with COVID right now, but especially, you know, within the past couple of weeks, we're starting to see so many department stores consider filing for bankruptcy if they haven't already. Do you anticipate, to piggyback on Kathy's question a little bit, do you anticipate the store within a store disappearing altogether? Or how would you see that transforming in the near future? I think um, the stores are definitely at risk. Um, I was reading an article about um, a VC investor who was advising um, her brands to just like stay put, see how this goes. Um, but I think those who recently like opened up very new stores are hurting much more than other brands. Um, so I think the benefit has just been dampened substantially. I don't know what the new steady state looks like, but as we've seen with other retailers and restaurants, once you hit a certain point and you just can't cover your fixed costs, you kind of have to let go of it, even if there's potential in a year or even a few months out. Um, so I, I don't know what the runway looks like for these companies. And I think that's going to be the big determining factor for their, their future, at least in the short term. Great. Well, thank you very much. Does anybody have any final questions for Emily before we part today? All right. Emily, great job. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to walk us through your project and presentation. And uh, everybody, thanks again. Thank you all thank so you. much. Right. I really appreciate yeah. it.